Welcome to Inside Arvada, the city of Arvada's podcast, where we bring you conversations with the people who make Arvada a thriving community. Hear stories about the past, present, and future of Arvada through the lens of the city team members who help make it all happen. Explore the complex topics impacting our community. From the roads you drive, to the water you drink, the parks where you play, to what your neighbors think. Join us as we take you Inside Arvada. Welcome to episode four of Inside Arvada, the official podcast of the city of Arvada. We're so thrilled that you're listening and tuning in. And if you're enjoying the podcast, we encourage you to help us spread the word by telling a friend, tell a neighbor, tell a coworker, give us a rating and subscribe. And on today's episode of Inside Arvada, we're talking all things trees with our guest, Ian McDonald, the city's forester. Ian has a long list of credentials that include being a certified arborist from the International Society of Arboriculture. He's an ISA certified municipal specialist, an ISA certified tree worker, and he has an ISA tree risk assessment qualification, as well as being a climbing specialist. He graduated with a Bachelor of Science from CU Boulder, where he studied hydrology, and he began his time with the city as a forestry technician in 2013, and in 2020, he was promoted to his current position as city forester. Obviously, he knows a lot about trees, and so today's interview was uh, very informative, And as always, I'm joined by my co-host today, Katie Patterson. Hi, Katie. Hey, Sean. I am so excited for today's episode. I have to say I'm not much of a tree aficionado. Well, everybody, I think, loves trees, generally, myself included. I got to learn so much about different types of trees and how we care for them. And then learned after we recorded, actually, that one thing Ian forgot to mention was that as a part of the Tree City USA Award that we receive as a city, um, which he does explain, there's an additional award they've gotten called the Growth Award. And what that means is that As a part of that Tree City USA award, they really have gone above and beyond in their commitments to uh, tree care here at the city. And so that was a really cool thing to hear uh, more about. So let's get started. Hi, Ian. Welcome to Inside Arvada. We're so excited to have you on as our guest. Let's begin by uh, telling us a little bit about yourself and what you do for the city. Uh, Sure. So um, I'm originally from Rhode Island, came out here for college. only went back to Rhode Island for a couple of years. Came back out here because that's where my wife wanted to live and I wanted to live where she is. So um, found my way to the city of Arvada uh, through the city of Boulder. Um, started working here about 10 years ago, 2013. Uh, so yeah, I guess I'm into my 11th year and I've been the city forester since 2020. Yeah, and uh, Arvada, we have a long history of prioritizing our tree care. Um, recently, we found out from the Arbor Day Foundation that we have been named Tree City USA for the 33rd straight year, and we also received the Growth Award for the fourth straight year. And those recognitions are not just handed out. They're not just automatic year over year. What is all the work that goes into earning those recognitions from the Arbor Day Foundation? Yeah, so our original... City Forester Craig Hilgis applied for our first one, like you said, uh, years ago. Um, and back then you had to do like a full um, like submittal. You had to type everything up, print it all out, mail it into them. It's a little bit easier for me today. I get to do it all electronically, but uh, the criteria is still just as stringent. So um, it's not like we send in like a, a fee and we're like, hey, we want to be Tree City USA. You know, been it for a while. Um, we actually have to document a number of uh, requirements. Um, the biggest one is a tree ordinance. Um, so every year I have to go through like our city code and pull out like um, land development code, uh, tree ordinance, what we have uh, in terms of like tree protections in our park systems, who's responsible for what um, in terms of like, does the city of Arvada maintain it? Do homeowners maintain it? Things like that. Um, They also want to know what our budget looks like, and that's broken out into uh, four categories. They want to know how much we spend on planting, maintenance, removal, and management of the tree canopy, which is um, like contracts and um, inventory updates, stuff like that. Um, They also look at if we're like investing in equipment, um, newer things. So we got like a new bucket truck uh, three, four years ago. So I got to submit that as part of it. And ultimately what they're looking for is they want at least $2 per capita spent on tree care in a city. 
um, to be minimal qualified for Tree City USA. Um, we spent $8.35 last year per capita. So we're like well over that. Arvada is very committed to a healthy urban canopy, um, which I'm very grateful for. Um, and another requirement is that we have um, Arbor Day celebration and a proclamation from our city council. So I submitted for that a couple of weeks ago, and I'm ho hoping to receive that from them fairly soon because on uh, May 14th, we'll be hosting Arbor Day. So, Yeah, that is the next question we want to talk about is the annual Arbor Day celebration that we have. And so last year was the first time I was part of it um, with Peck Elementary. It was a bittersweet year. Uh, to be part of that because Peck Elementary had been the school that we partnered with for 37 years. And unfortunately, uh, last year was the last year with Peck because they were one of the schools that closed down. And so it was pretty cool that I think it was your idea to plant the 37 trees in honor of the 37 years with Peck Elementary. What are just some of your favorite memories from that annual uh, Arbor Day tree planting? Yeah, it's the kids, obviously. I mean, they get super excited. They get super into it. They they don't care if it's raining or snowing, if it's muddy, sunny. Like I've, there's very few kids I've seen that are like, yeah, this isn't for me. Like almost every single one of them's like, yeah, give me that really big shovel. I'm jumping into this hole. I'm digging for worms. Like, and I can't say there's been any group that I'm like, oh man, these kids really don't want to be here. Um, so that's always the most exciting thing. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, we tried to plant 37 trees last year, and we did, but man, did it rain hard last year. Um, we got, I want to say we got 23 of the trees in the ground that day. Um, and we went back and finished planting them. So we did get 37 trees ultimately, but what was really fun about that one is, um, we had a lot of the folks that had been involved in Arbor Day over the last, um, you know, 37 years, um, come back. So we had principals from Peck Elementary. We had some teachers that were kids when they were, um, doing some of the earlier days. So they remember planting as kids and then they were their teachers. Now um, we had uh, the former city forester, former city managers. Uh, I believe we had some former city council members. Um, yeah. We had former employees of the parks department. We actually had the, um, I want to say Kyle Sylvester is the assistant parks director over in Brighton. And he started here in our forestry department. So he came out, planted a tree with us. So, um, yeah, that one was pretty special, maybe a little ambitious to go for 37 trees, but we got them all in eventually. Um, so yeah, I mean, over the years, uh, Craig kept really good records and, and photos, uh, that I've gone through over the last few years and tried to label. So I've seen some pretty interesting projects where they planted a lot of trees and, um, they partnered with some senior, cent uh, senior ho housing in, in years past. So They've tried a lot of different things, and usually the weather's pretty good. He kept records of that, so sometimes it snows. Yeah, those kids last year were tough. They were not deterred by that rain. No, they did not care. <laughs> and now going forward with Pet closing down, we're going to partner with different schools each year and just do different plantings around the city each year. Yeah, that's the idea. We're partnering with Stott this year, and um, they're, they seem excited for it. I'm not sure they fully understand what they're getting themselves into yet, but uh, I've been communicating with the teachers and I think they thought we were going to plant like one tree because I sent them the list and they're like, oh, we'd like to do the Catalpa. And I was like, no, we're planting all those trees. So um, I'm hoping the kids come out enthusiastic and um, yeah, we're going to plant over at Yankee Doodle Park and um, I'm looking forward to engaging some new kids, new schools, because we have a lot of great elementary schools in Arvada and I think it'll be a lot of fun to to rotate through them. So Hopefully I don't uh, overextend the elementary schools that are like, oh, we, what is this? I've never done this before, but I think they'll be excited to engage. I, it, so far, Stott has been. so A great hands-on learning experience for those kids, too. Oh, yeah, definitely. So I think you mentioned the term urban forestry. And when I first joined the city, I saw that and I was a little bit confused. I'm like, you know, we don't live in like a metropolis. It's not like a downtown area. Um, but urban forestry really does describe the work that you do. How is it different than more of traditional forestry? Yeah. So urban forestry, I mean, in a nutshell, I would say is more focused on like the individual tree rather than the collective trees and traditional forestry is like you're, you're looking at the full body, you're looking at um, forest management. Um, maybe you're looking at like logging stands for commercial development. Um, and you're looking in that traditional forest, so you're like here in Colorado would be like in the mountains, right? You're, like that's where your, your natural forest stands are and how you're managing that something that you know, say the state forest service is looking at is, is full uh, management. 
Um, whereas urban forestry, you know, down here in the city, you have individual homeowners, they have a tree in their yard, you're calling a health, a tree healthcare expert. Um, and they're coming out and they're diagnosing your tree. They're not like, well, let's look at the whole neighborhood. And I mean, they might look at your neighbor's trees and be like, well, this one looks like it's suffering from this. That's probably what's happening to your tree here, but they're, they're more or less treating your individual tree. And as big as we get is going to, we do look at our whole tree canopy. So I don't want to say we don't look at it as a whole, but when we go into a park, we're looking, what does this park need? And then we're drilling down, like, what does this individual tree need that we're taking care of? This tree needs this type of pruning, or it needs um, this plant health care or integrated pest management um, to be done on it. So that's kind of a, that's how I see the difference at least. Yeah. And uh, part of your job is removing dead and dying trees that need to be removed. Um, you know, we operate under the philosophy that we want to plant more trees each year than we remove, which we accomplished that last year in 2023. But occasionally we do have some projects going on in the city where trees are planted right on top of underground utilities, such as the sewer line project that's going on right now at uh, Danny Kendrick and Davis Lane Parks. So we're going to have to unfortunately remove some of those trees in order to access the sewer line there. What is our plan for how we go about replacing those trees that we have to remove? Yeah. Um, every year in August, we go through our park system and we inventory uh, every tree. I always tell my crew, 50% or more dead. And if we if it's at that borderline 50%, if we prune it, is it going to look really bad? If the answer is yes, we'll mark it down for removal. We try to get to them through the winter time. Um, but yeah, like you said, sometimes live trees need to go. Um, we always try to focus right tree, right place. I have the benefit of having modern day GPS. I can sit at my computer. I can see where all the storm lines are, the water distribution lines. Um, not necessarily Excel Energy, but we can do 811s for that now. You know, 30 years ago, they didn't have that. 100 years, they would have to pull out you know, the parks map and be like, okay, the line is supposedly here. Let's not put a tree here. It's a lot more labor intensive. And further back than that, um, you know, those lines probably weren't even there when those cottonwood trees started growing or elm trees started growing. So some of it has been installed after the fact. Some of it was, we planted trees right on top of lines without knowing it. Um, and when you have to do utility improvements, we have to work around some of that. Um, our utility team has been really good working with us on Davis Lane and Danny Kendricks to implement the tree protection zone. We've moved the sewer line a couple times to try and save some of our bigger, more mature trees. But part of the compromise is you know, have a couple of these trees are going to have to go or, or we're not going to have a sewer line large enough to service the west side of town or the east side of town. Like you to have some development, some of this stuff is going to go. Um, so in those instances where some of those trees have to go, we have a consulting arborist come out. They do a tree evaluation. Um, most of them are certified with the 10th edition of the tree and plant appraisal guide. Some of them still use the ninth edition. I found that they come out fairly similar, but essentially what happens is they'll take, say, a 30 inch cottonwood tree and they'll compare it to like a pristine specimen 30 inch cottonwood tree. If that tree was pristine and perfect, you would ultimately replace it with 30 inches of trunk diameter. So it would be 15 two inch diameter trees. Um, but most of the time your tree is not perfect. You have dead in there, you have trunk wounds, you have some decay, maybe the tree is past its prime because um, they don't live forever. Uh, they just live longer than we do. Um, and so you start mitigating down and say you get to like 15 inches in, of mitigated uh, diameter. So they would give us roughly seven trees of two inch diameter. Um, and we put that kind of into a big mitigation pot and we say, all right, we're taking all these trees out. We have 150 inches that we need to replace. How many can we replace on site? Danny Kendrick's park and Davis lane have a, a lot of trees. Can they hold more? Absolutely. They can. So we're planting back say 50 diameter inches. We're going to do 25, two inch trees in each of those parks. Well, the inches that don't get replaced we're compensated for monetarily that goes into our tree replacement fund. And we use that in other parks throughout the city that need more trees than perhaps those two parks can hold. So 
it works very similar with the land development code too, if you're putting in a new building and trees have to be removed as a result. So, yeah, so very thorough process. We're not just going in there, uh, taking trees no. down willy nilly and just kind of going about. Yeah. Different. And there's a lot of back and forth on it. I mean, we're putting up tree protection zones to try and save what is there, but you know, construction is just disturbs the ground. Maybe you lose a tree, those trees that aren't planned on removing, we still do a mitigation report on those in case we do lose them in the future. Um, we can say, Hey, you know what? We lost this tree. We need to replace it. Looking for those funds. Um, and it's just, it's worked into the cost of the project. Now you and your team are responsible for maintaining trees that are on city property. And that's about 14,000 trees. I think there's about 10 times that number of trees on private property throughout the city. And so those trees the property owner is responsible for maintaining those. So you know, we don't want people going to our forestry department asking how to maintain those trees. But since we have you here, uh, we want to talk a little bit about how homeowners can take care of their trees. You know, obviously, it's always good to use a professional tree care um, to take care of your trees. One of the big things we always try and educate our public on is emerald ash borer. And so what are kind of some of the first steps for people to look for with EAB and, and what should they be doing? Yeah. I mean, specifically to emerald ash borer, you got to determine whether you have an ash tree or not. You can Google ash trees and find tons of photos of what they look like. They're fairly distinct for the area. If you're not sure, having a plant healthcare uh, expert come in, most likely in the form of a tree service company, um, have them come out, evaluate their tree. Um, you know, when it comes to tree care, it's, it's, funny the first people that get called generally are us because somebody wants an impartial opinion right you're calling a tree service they're coming down they're selling a service so i get a lot of phone calls of, of folks just asking me general questions about their trees um it's always a good idea to have a tree care service that you trust to give you um you know actual facts about your tree like they're not just like oh yeah tree's dead you got to cut it down like you called them up because you're not sure if it's actually dead or not. Like, and you got to take their word for it. So, um, finding a, a qualified tree care service that you trust is very important, just like you would a plumber or an electrician for your house. Um, I think we had discussed, uh, before this podcast, um, I always kind of point people to Denver. They have a very thorough licensing program and I know a lot of people are like, well, how come Arvada doesn't do it? It's expensive to run and maintain. So I just assume let Denver pay for it and we can piggyback off of that. Um, and the office of the city forester there has, I want to say 250, 300 tree care companies that have gone to the city of Denver and they say, we want to, we want to do tree care in Denver. And Denver says, okay, here's a written test they have to pass. Then they have to go out into the field and show that they are a competent in the field they have to show their license. They have to show they're insured. Um, so it, you can use that list to find tree care companies that you care for, or sorry, tree care companies that have been somewhat vetted. But again, not all tree, not all tree care companies are the same. So looking at reviews as well um, to find yourself like, okay, what what are other people saying their experience with this tree care company has been? Um, if you have large trees, that's the way to go. If you have a smaller tree that you planted, you can find lots of videos on YouTube on how to do proper pruning. Um, anything up to five inches, more or less, you can buy a pole pruner at Home Depot and, and do some pruning yourself. I always recommend finding a tree care company that can do the work, but I understand there's a lot of DIYers. I'm, I'm one myself. Um, but if you have a big tree, it's, it's worth having a tree care company that you can trust. So um, with Emerald Ash Borer, when you have an ash tree, um, I always kind of tell people 10 inches or less, I would 10 to six inches in diameter. You can still treat your tree. They'll probably do like a, um, a soil injection. You got to do it every year. Um, they charge generally charge per diameter inch. I'm not sure what the soil injection rate is. Um, but you can expect to pay like probably 15, $20 per diameter inch, um, which is similar to the tree injection cost as well as 15 to 20 dollars diameter inch um if you have an over 10 if you have six or under you probably want to consider replacing the tree because your yearly cost of maintaining that 
against Emerald Ash Borer is going to far outpace the cost of removing and replacing. If you have a large ash tree, which a lot of folks on the east side of town do, um, it's worth having a trunk induction done. You, it's good usually for two years, but you can expect to probably pay $230, $350, um, depending on your diameter inch for sure. So say you got a 15-inch diameter tree, you're looking at at least $150 for that. Um, but if you don't treat it, you are going to lose it. It is here in Arvada. It's, um, we confirmed it in the Homestead Park neighborhood, um, and it's slowly spreading out from there. I've seen a lot of folks have to remove their ash trees in that area um, as a result, um, and it is just slowly spreading a- across the front range. Um, it started in Boulder in 2013, so it's working its way down the 36 corridor more or less, and um, there's been several municipalities that have identified it at this point. So, And by having your trees treated for EAB, that helps... Stop yeah. The spread. Yeah. I mean, it can help stop the spread through the city. Um, it can also, I mean, it's going to preserve your tree, right? Ultimately, yeah. which is going to, you know, boost your home value um, by having a nice ash tree out in front. But it, it is, it is an ongoing and regular expense. So it's something you have to consider when you're, if you have an ash tree. But if you don't have an ash tree, that doesn't mean you don't have to consider the regular upkeep of your tree. It's always cheaper to do something regularly than it is to wait 10, 15 years and be like, oh man, I got to spend $2,500, to have this tree pruned. Like, you know, you could spread that cost over, you know, every two or three years, probably every three years, have somebody come out, just prune the deadwood out of your tree, maybe raise a couple limbs up. You don't want to over prune them. Um, so we always, we go with a three to five year pruning or try to go to a three to five year pruning cycle and recommendation for trees. Cause you really don't need to do it every year. Um, three to five years is sufficient. Absolutely. So we don't take care of everyone's trees throughout the city, just the ones that are in city property, but we do uh, do some tree care programs or tree related programs. So we have trees across Arvada and that's when we offer people to buy trees at low cost in the fall and then they come pick them up in the spring. We do our annual Christmas tree recycling, you know, right after Christmas, obviously in January where folks can drop off their Christmas trees. And then we also have a free mulch opportunity, which Ian can share a little bit more about, a new opportunity coming soon over there on the west side of town. And then we have the plant a tree and memorial tree program. So tell us a little bit more about the free mulch opportunity that we're working on and the plant a tree and memorial tree programs. Sure. Yeah. As you mentioned, we've always, Arvada has been really good about offering programs throughout the year um, from tree recycling to free mulch. Um, and I should say Christmas tree recycling. Um, the free mulch has always been offered. It was originally at our parks maintenance facility, but with the larger facility, we didn't have the room for the bin anymore. So we moved it out to the bird's nest disc golf course. It was available year round 24 seven, which also meant it was available year round 24 seven for people to dump there, which is why we had to stop providing that location. So we, have decided to move it uh, to the upper parking lot of the reservoir. Um, we're going to build a concrete bin there to store um, our mulch. And the reason it's not available yet is we just haven't had time to build the bin yet. Um, we're shooting for May to have it there. It will be available um, when the reservoir is open. So it won't be all year round, but it will, I believe the reservoir is open from April until like September or October, don't quote me on that. I'd have to look it up on this. October, yeah. Yeah, I'd have to look it up on the city website. But it's more or less when people are looking for mulch anyways, is you know, beginning of the garden spring is really when people are looking for the mulch, which is why I've been fielding a lot of questions lately about it. Um, we do intend to have it back up. We just have not had the time to build the bins because we were gonna do that in April, but we had two snowstorms and a windstorm, and um, we're just getting to the finishing touches of that. Um, we just got our tree uh delivery. Um, for the trees that we're going to plant throughout our park system yesterday. So we had to unload that, get them stored away. So um, I'm hoping next week or as soon as Arbor Day is over, which is about two weeks from now, um, that's when we'll have the opportunity to to build those bins. Um, The Memorial Tree Program has been around for probably the longest um, in terms of what we've offered uh, the city for, for folks. It started actually with um, Indian Crest golf course. And that's where a lot of the original memorial trees were planted. Um, And it's moved into the city when 
Indian Crest was like, we, we can't just host this here anymore. Like people, like we have too many trees basically is what happened. So they got moved into, um, it was North Jeffco Parks and Rec at the time. Um, and we started planting trees throughout our park system. And basically what it does is it allows folks to pay for a tree in celebration or memory of a loved one or an event. Um, and we have, had I been going through the inventory, I want to say we have 450 memorial active memorial trees um i want to say i have about 50 that i just can't i don't know if they're still there or not the records just weren't good enough to be like yep that's for sure that tree but um yeah i mean 450 trees over 30 years we we have lost some and we've we've tried to replace some some folks just buy the replacement um but that's pretty remarkable i i always tell people when they're at majestic view park almost half that park is memorial trees. Like those trees were bought by somebody else and planted there. Um, and there's parks like this program has become so popular. There's actually parks that I'm like, we can't, can't plant there anymore. But majestic view being one of them, like the only way I can plant in that park is by removing a tree because it's full and it. And I'd love that people want to plant that many trees. Um, but you can pick any tree or not any tree, any park. And we have a list of trees. It's mostly oak, maple, linden that people go for, but they'll go with catalpa or coffee tree. Um, I try to keep a, a fairly wide range for folks. So um, yeah, the trees are about $350. And basically what we do is we coordinate with the the family and pick a date that works for everybody during the, the week, Monday through Friday, and we'll pre-dig the hole and get the tree set. And a lot of times the families will come out, they'll do a memorial service or a celebration service and um, they'll backfill the hole and they absolutely help and love participating and planting that tree. And we we're happy to let them do the whole thing if they want at that point, we just make sure it's finished off correctly and we give it some water and away we go. So. Very cool. We will uh, include links to the those programs and services in the show notes if anyone's interested. So if we are, if someone is looking to expand our urban canopy, is there certain uh, type of trees that you suggest people plant here in Arvada that are friendly to our, or the climate is friendly to those trees? Yeah. Um, if you see ash for sale, stay far away. They're technically not be, supposed to be being sold in Arvada, or not Arvada, but the state of Colorado. Um, but I know I've seen a few things where it's like, oh, wait a second, like that's an ash tree, like don't buy that. Um, it was worse in 2013, I think, when the first moratorium came and people were like desperate to get rid of the ash that they weren't supposed to sell. Um, the tree industry as a whole is kind of trending more towards like smaller, more compact. Um, orna- I, w- I don't, I don't want necessarily want to say ornamental trees because they don't all flower, but your big cottonwoods and like locusts and ash trees, like your big shady trees more or less are, are falling out of favor with um, growers and they're going more for like, not necessarily pear, but like a more oval shaped tree, a little bit easier to maintain. um, Doesn't necessarily take over your whole yard and hang over your house and stuff. So um, for me, I would go with like drought tolerant, um, not very showy trees. And I know a lot of people love their like red fall color, but, um, I always say they're the divas of the tree world. They want a lot of attention. And if you give it to them, they'll like, they'll give you your nice fall color. But if you don't give it to them, they'll let you know that they're not getting attention very quickly. Um, and a lot of times they're the first trees to start declining. Um, the unexciting, boring trees like coffee, catalpa, um, white oak trees that don't get the fall color, um, hackberry, uh, Mm -hmm. Those ones, if you want a big shade tree, hackberry is great, but like oak has a ton of varieties and stuff that you can choose from that are more compact. And yeah, I I hate to say it, but like the non-showy boring trees are the best way to go. They they don't want a whole lot from you and they'll give you what you're looking for in return. If you want something showy, crab apple is always nice. There's lots of different flowering trees, hawthorn and stuff. So um, yeah, it really depends on what you want. Stay away from the divas if you can. Yeah. People love their maple trees, but maple trees do not love Colorado. So that's not to say there aren't maple trees that are doing just fine. There are. I've seen some great ones. Um, Last year was a fantastic fall because we had such a wet spring um, and a cool fall. And I drove around and I was like, man, there are some like textbook autumn blaze, like pamphlet. That's what you expect to see every single year. But I don't see it every single year. Um, we have a lot of yellow here, so 
um, which is mostly from the ash trees and, and locusts. So that's you're going to get your your vibrant yellows. And then next question was about some of the misconceptions that you get or calls frequent calls that we get from residents about our forestry department. And so, you know, one of them is about property owners and which limbs they can trim, whether they're on their property or city's property. What are some of those uh, misconceptions or common questions that you get? Yeah. Um, a lot of times people want to know like who's responsible for the tree between the sidewalk and the road. Um, it is in the city right away, but the right of way maintenance is on the homeowner. Um, we also get a lot of like, hey, my neighbor's tree is growing over my property line. I want to prune it. The neighbor is saying I can't. Once that limb pro crosses your property line, you do have a right to maintain that. Um, but I always caution folks, like you can't just go out there and like strip all the limbs off that tree. Because if the tree does die, your neighbor could have an enforceable action for the loss of their asset. So it's always best to have a good relationship with your neighbors so you can take care of that stuff. But if you don't, you do have the right to maintain stuff that's on your property. And that property line goes from ground to to sky. So if you have limbs protruding over your property line, you do have the right to maintain them back to the property line. Um, just keep in mind that if that tree dies, you could be, be moderate, use in moderation. You're like, don't just strip the tree because you could get yourself in a lot of trouble. Um, same goes for city owned trees. If they're growing over your property line, um, absolutely. You can prune them back to the property line. Um, a lot of folks will write in, ask Arvada is like, Hey, limbs growing over. You guys need to come take care of this. Reality is, is we have four people for 14,000 trees. The limb growing over the property line is probably going to be pretty low on our service um, requests. It doesn't mean we're not going to come out and take care of it, but you're going to be waiting a while. Um, you can go out and prune that limb off. Please don't throw it back over the fence. Cut it up, throw it in your tr municipal trash. They will haul it off. Um, if it's a really large limb or it's dead and it's hanging over, we'll do our best to come and take care of it in a, in a more timely manner. Um, and that's a lot of the stuff we get. We're working on trying to get trees off of our fence lines um, just because we do have a lot that, I mean, think of how many miles of fence line we have throughout our park system compared to like one homeowner that has, you know, two or three trees that are in the park behind their house. So I have all of those fence lines in that park and the trees that are on our side to maintain. Um, my crew knows that when they're in those parks, trying to prune those trees back off the property line as part of our maintenance operations. Um, but again, we can't get to every single limb. So if you have a few that you want to cut off, we're not going to come out to your house and be like, Hey, you can't touch those trees. Like you do have a right to prune those back. All right. So now I will turn it over to Katie for the lightning round. Okay. So we're going to do a quick lightning round of quick fire questions to get to know you a little better, help our listeners get to know you. Um, so first, what is your favorite thing about Arvada? Oh, um, I guess the community. Um, I feel like people are really engaged in what's going on in the city. Um, I think we see that a lot when we have like our um, open houses or um, like planning committee ones where it's like, hey, come down and like take a look at this project that we're putting together. Give us your opinion. Um, people come out and they they let us know what their opinion is. And um, it's not always bad. Um, which is great people, which means we're doing what we're supposed to be doing. A lot of people like what we're putting out. Um, but you see it on speak up Arvada as well. Um, when we ask people to like vote on new playgrounds and, you know, people want to see a certain theme or what have you. So, um, and our ask Arvada system, like you see people they're they're going through the parks, they're going through the trails, they're seeing stuff. And we don't always get like, this is broken. That's bad. You should do a better job. Like there are those people, but, um, they're pointing out things that need to be corrected. There's a lot of people we get that are just like, hey, went down the trail. You know, it's been eight hours since the snow came and like I was able to do my entire walk. Like you guys had it plowed. Like I see stuff even about our roads being cleared after a snowstorm where people are like, man, I was driving to work and I'm coming from Denver and it's roads are bad there and the roads are bad on the highway. And then I get to Arvada and they're clear. Like this is great. So um, I think just people really are engaged in in the community around us and they and they they want to see it as best as it can be and and we want to provide that yeah i love that that's a um answer we haven't gotten so far and it is uh 
so true. It's like a two way street with our uh, community. That's yeah. great. Um, what was your first, last, or best concert? My first concert was Bob Dylan, um, which I wish I could say was amazing, but I think he was like a hundred at the time. Um, no, I'm kidding. I know he's not a hundred, but <laughs> it was cool. I can say I saw Bob Dylan. Um, the last concert I went to, uh, was fish, the jam band. Um, I actually took my, uh, six year old son who was thrilled. He loved the glow sticks. Um, and he actually made it almost all the way to the end of the concert and they, they played for a while. Um, and actually I think that was the best concert I've been to. Like, and I think it was the best cause my son was there and he was just like thrilled by the whole experience. So, um, I had taken him when he was five and he fell asleep after like, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, but in all fairness, it was a Friday and he'd been at school and he was exhausted. So I took him on a Saturday last year and he made it almost to the end, but they played until like 1130. So he trooped it out. Um, I think that was probably my favorite. I really enjoyed uh, watching him uh, just like experience that. So that's awesome. Yeah. Getting a little uh, music aficionado out of him. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> so um, I've been to several. Another one that stands out is um, I went and saw a band, uh, an Evento Russo duo and college and that was a good one it was a fairly cheap two-man group it was a drummer and a pianist i don't think they're together anymore but um for some reason that one stands out maybe because it was my 21st birthday but um, <laughs> i enjoyed it that was a good one went with my roommates so nice um so what brought you to work at the city yeah so I, as i mentioned at the beginning like i got into forestry um with the city of boulder um as a seasonal uh and I did a couple years of commercial tree work when um, my wife and I were living back in Rhode Island. Um, came back out here, got a job back with Boulder as a seasonal. And I got maybe a month after I was with them, they're like, hey, City of Arvada is looking for like a full-time arborist. You should apply. And I'm like, yeah, okay. Like I'm going to get that job. Um, I was like, all right, I'll apply. Like there's no way that's happening. Like I was looking for private tree care um, companies to go and work for at the same time and got the interview came out here, met the crew. Um, it was like Robert Bromley, who's our open space supervisor now, Craig Hillegas, Joe McLean. I think there might've been one other person in the interview. Um, and yeah, I, good interview. They wanted me to come back and do the climbing test. And I remember, remember doing the climbing test and the, there's a honey locust out in front of city hall. It's still there. And I hadn't climbed in a few months at this point. So I was a bit rusty trying to get up in the tree. And at one point, Craig and Joe were like looking at other trees waiting for me to get up there. And I was like, oh boy, this is not going well. Um, but I I got the job and I, I was super thankful to get it. I just wanted to like learn more as much as I could. And um, Joe was a, a great mentor. Craig was a great mentor. Um, they really gave me the opportunity to like learn and develop and like, you know, put that time and energy into an employee, which is what I, one of the things I really love about working for the city of Arvada is their commitment to employment, employee development. Um, and a few years went by, I had an opportunity to become the lead worker. Um, I took that. I think I was a lead worker for about a year and then Craig was getting ready to retire. And I was sat down with him one day and was like, Hey, do you think I can do this? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. Like, these are the things you probably want to start focusing on. And, um, he's the one who got helped me get the ISA certification and pushed me towards that municipal specialist climber stuff as I was developing through my career. So, um, I was in a good position when he retired to, to secede him. So that's awesome. That's yeah. a really, yeah. Awesome story. Um, what was your first job? Um, my first paying quote unquote job was mowing lawns. Um, I mowed two lawns when I was a kid. Um, I think I was making like $30 every other week. So that was, that was my first job, but my first like W2 paycheck job, I was a uh, busser at a restaurant in Newport called Sardella's. It's still there. They've gotten bigger. Um, I actually was just there for a uh, rehearsal dinner last summer for a friend of mine who got married. And it was interesting going back as like a patron and not working there. And I was like, man, this place has changed, but there were still like a few people that were still working there. I was like, man, this guy is still working at this restaurant. Like, okay. Um, great food, good restaurant. Um, it's actually owned by the former mayor of Newport. Um, so that was my first like W2 job, but 
Nice. Yeah. That's a good, yeah, that's a good first job. Uh, what was your favorite project that you've done with the city up to this point? Yeah. Um, I've worked on a lot over the years. Um, I don't know if I, if any one in particular stands out as being like, yeah, that was amazing. I mean, we were kind of talking before we started this podcast of like, what qualifies as a project? Is it like a big, like multi-departmental, you know, working together kind of thing like I've done with like Davis Lane and Danny Kendricks? Um, or is it like tree planting or Arbor Day, like smaller projects? Um, you know, I, I don't have one that really stands out as being like, that was the best one. Um, but maybe it's just because I've been here for a while and I've <laughs> worked on several projects over the years. I'm sure somebody will be like, dude, what about that project? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, that was a good project. Like, um, so, I, yeah, unfortunately, I, I can't speak specifically. Lot, you spoke to some general programs yeah, that I, you like. Yeah. I mean, we do a lot of yeah. different things. So, you know, tree pruning is a, a project that my crew does every year. And that's still something I'm trying to get back out there and do with them because now I go and climb trees with them. And I'm like, don't look over here. I didn't even tie my climbing knot right. <laughs> So um, they're good sports about it. I'm sure they are like, oh, man, he's coming back out in the field again. Look, he's going to try to climb a tree. Just go back to the office. Go write some emails. <laughs> nice. Well, yeah. thanks so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it, Ian. Yeah, thanks for having me down here. This is, uh, this is really cool. Thanks, Ian. Appreciate it. Yeah. So before we let you go, we have our... Uh, recent news and updates other events happening in Arvada to let you all know about um and as always please uh submit any feedback or listener questions you have at podcast at arvada.org and one thing that's happened in the last month or so is that our new mayor lauren simpson had her first state of the city presentation and so we will put a link to the youtube video youtube recording of that in our show notes for folks and then last time we talked about the volunteer appreciation event that um, was delayed due to weather. And so Sean, tell us a little bit more about the updates on that. Yeah. So our volunteer appreciation event was supposed to be on April 27th, but we got rained out and we have a new date now. We're going to be holding that event June 8th from one to three. So that's a new date and a new time. Uh, invites have been sent out to our volunteers. So please go ahead and RSVP if you got one of those invitations and want to attend. And now we're pretty much fully into summer. And so that means the Splash Pad and Old Town Fountain are both opening Memorial Day weekend. The Ralston Central Splash Pad hours are 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Or excuse me, the Ralston Central Splash Pad hours are 10 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily. And the Old Town Fountain is open four times a day for two hours at a time. So it's 9 to 11, noon to 2, 4 to 6, and 8 to 10 p.m. Thank you so much to our guest today, Ian McDonald, the city forester. Please be sure to listen to our next episode featuring Marco Rendazzo, a neighborhood leader from our Neighbors Connected program. To stay in touch with the podcast, you can visit our website at arvadaco.gov slash podcast, where you can subscribe to the show or send us an email at podcast at arvada.org to ask questions that will be answered on an upcoming episode. Thank you to our listeners. And for today's podcast, it was recorded and edited by Arvada Media Services producer, James Long. And I will leave you with today's fun fact. The world's tallest tree is a sequoia in Redwood National Park that goes by the name of Hyperion. It is 379 feet tall, but its exact location is not public in order to help protect the tree and the surrounding area. Whoa.